Hi, this is TopCat, and welcome to the second and final part of my combat guide for XCOM Chimera Squad. In part one, we covered Breach Mode, and today we'll focus on battlefield tactics on the main combat map. This isn't going to be the shortest guide ever, but before we're done, we'll cover topics like target selection, positioning your agents on the map, how to use the turn order to your advantage, mitigate incoming damage, and quite a bit more, and we'll do it in as much detail as possible. There are even a couple of bonus tips for breach mode that didn't make it into part one. So while I know it's a big ask, if you'll stay with me to the end, I can promise a video that's positively stuffed with both specific tips and food for thought to help you keep learning on your own as you continue to play the game. Your agents run to nearby cover immediately following breach mode. The spots they choose are outside of your control. And while they're usually okay, you should definitely take stock of the situation and decide which members of the team need to prioritize moving to a better position as part of their first turn. There's a lot to take in at the start of an encounter, and we just want to make sure you're not starting off too exposed to easy flanking shots or anything like that. We'll talk a lot more about positioning in a few minutes, but we need to cover some other ground first. Combat is still turn-based, but now the turns for each combatant interleave and there's no longer a discrete turn for the player followed by a turn for the enemy. Each agent and alien will be assigned a spot in the turn order, and for the most part that will be locked in. Now, this makes the turn more rigid in some ways because it's no longer possible to cycle through our squad to decide who should go first, see how that action turns out, and so on. At the same time, the new system also opens up new decision-making space. When prioritizing enemies, it isn't just a case of who seems to be the most dangerous taken on its own terms, but which one is coming up in the turn order, especially if they're close enough to take a flanking shot. While the developers didn't give us the raw firepower to mow down all comers before they can take a shot, they did supply us with tools to play with the turn order and turn it to our advantage. The Medic, Terminal, has one ability that can push an enemy down in the turn order, and another that grants any one ally a single action immediately. Similarly, Shelter can also push an enemy down in the turn order. Used at the right time, these abilities can be literal lifesavers. There's also Team Up, a free action letting you move any agent you choose up in the turn order so that they go next. This can only be done one time each mission, but it's available to every agent and can be very powerful when you really need something extra to help turn the tide. So the turn order can and should be manipulated, just as you should also use it as an important factor to prioritize targets. And speaking of targets, this is probably a good time to draw a bead on them. If there's one area where Chimera Squad demands thought, it's target selection. Among the factors you'll need to weigh are each enemy's ability to take quality shots, or even flank you, raw damage potential with their best shot, special abilities that will play havoc with your plans, and turn order. Every one of these factors and more are important, and your level of firepower makes it feel as though you're trying to chop down a redwood with a butter knife. So you really have to prioritize who to go after first. While it's not possible to offer a detailed breakdown of every possible situation or combination of enemies, let's at least cover some broad guidelines. Setting aside turn order for the moment, enemies who disrupt one or more agent's ability to act are usually more of a problem than one who simply shoots a weapon and does damage. A few examples. A purifier can set most of the squad on fire, which keeps them from using their abilities. A dominator can mind control an agent so that they are not only unavailable to you, but will actively attack your other agents. An acolyte can levitate an agent so that they're completely unable to act. Enemies who disable weapons and force you to waste an action reloading can also be an issue, but even that is still situational. If your sectoid Verge is using psionics every turn, and Cherub is throwing up shields and bashing heads in melee, then it isn't necessarily a high priority to stop some hitman from draining their gun's ammo. On the other hand, when a purifier sets half your squad on fire, that keeps them from using any of their abilities that we could have used to heal damage or mitigate it. He isn't just dealing damage, he's making us less effective in virtually every way and making the shots his friends land much more telling than they would have been. If you have access to the squad's full complement of actions and abilities, then it's possible to deal with anything the game throws at you. But take that away and you're just controlling four guys who are out 
outnumbered and outgunned, and that's going to be a tough slog. So my broad guideline is to take out the aliens who will be most disruptive to your crew. Prioritize those whose turn order is coming up unless one enemy is just so much worse than anyone else that you're prepared to let all of the others go ham on you while you focus fire on the troublemaker. I do recommend caution on that approach, but there are times where you'll want to do it. Before we move on, I do want to add one more thing. Target selection doesn't just involve picking who to deal damage to next. I've mentioned some of the options we have to tinker with the turn order, but there are a lot of other tools at our disposal as well. When it comes to an enemy who's coming up next in the turn order, for example, it's often the case that its health is too high to take it out with one shot, but allowing it to have its way with you is about as appealing as being packed into an elevator with a large group of hyperflatulent mutons. Thankfully, we have a number of tools at our fingertips that can help when we need to finesse an enemy that we don't have the raw firepower to put down just yet. So let's talk about that next. Regardless of how many weapon upgrades we rush through the assembly process, raw damage is not going to carry you to victory in XCOM Chimera Squad. Walk into a room with 9 enemies and most of them will still be alive at the start of the second round. They will take shots, use various special abilities, and generally try to make your life miserable, and our squad simply cannot absorb all of that and survive. Thankfully, we have options that go well beyond damage dealing. There are a number of ways to mitigate incoming attacks. Terminal's heal also improves that squad member's defense. Verge can stun an enemy for up to a full turn. Zephyr's attacks can stun and root an enemy. Cherub can use energy shields to completely block an enemy attack. Patchwork can put any enemy or ally in stasis for a full turn. Torque can tongue pull and bind a particularly dangerous enemy. And that's not even close to a comprehensive list. If you look at whichever characters you're bringing to a mission, there should always be a couple of solid ways to mess with the enemy's ability to do what they want when they want. That won't win the battle by itself, but it should buy time while you keep chipping away at their numbers. And it really is important to get their numbers down. The most dangerous part of any encounter is usually the first turn or two when they have such a huge numbers advantage and so many attacks are aimed at our agents. The sooner we get the number of inbound attacks down, the better. And for that reason, I would recommend using hard lockdowns like stasis on enemies that are both scary and have a particularly large health bar. It will help a lot more to take out a few of those less terrifying but still dangerous aliens in the first round than it would be to focus all of your fire on one guy who will still be standing at the end of the turn along with all of the minions that you might have taken down but didn't. You may never be able to stop as many of their attacks as you want to, but if you actively look to create the opportunities, then you'll find that you can block as many as you need. We can deal with taking some damage. We just can't absorb all the damage. And on that note, let's talk a bit about health and how to use it as a resource. Given a choice between avoiding damage and taking it, I'd obviously prefer to avoid it all. But we don't need to avoid it all to have a successful mission. In XCOM 2, the penalty for getting wounded was up to a month in the hospital, and that dictated an approach to avoid taking wounds whenever possible. But in Chimera Squad, an agent can get hurt and still be as good as new once they make it back to headquarters. Mostly. If an agent is gravely wounded and or takes critical hits, there is a chance they'll have a scar, and these always carry some form of penalty, like minus three to help or mobility. You can put them in training for a few days to get rid of the scarring, but that's not always convenient, especially in the early game when you have very few agents to work with. And it ties up the training room when it could be put to better use getting new abilities. What this means is that health is a resource that can be spent during a mission as long as we don't get reckless about it. Our agents can definitely die, and it's not great getting them hurt too badly. But within those parameters, I'm here to tell you that you can and will be able to take a licking and keep on ticking if you pick your spots carefully. And the total amount of damage one agent absorbs doesn't matter. It has more to do with how low their health drops during the mission. If someone gets hit, then healed, then hit, healed again, and so on, they can go back to base in the same condition as if they'd never been hit at all. 
as long as their health is kept from falling down to maybe a third or less of the total, they should be fine. But if they hit their last point of health, a scar is likely. So this is really just one more thing to weigh in the whole process of selecting targets and mitigation, because it isn't essential or even possible to stop every shot from connecting. The question is which you can choose to allow and which are most important to prevent in one way or another. And having said that, I think we're finally ready to get back to the idea of positioning during combat. Positioning on the battle map has been possibly the single most important tactical aspect in all of the XCOM games, and it's still critically important here. We're frequently dumped into a relatively small map with a significant number of enemies. It's common that you'll be flanked if you move forward at all, but it's often critical that you do just that. Whether it's to pursue a timed objective or to manufacture opportunities to flank the enemy before they can flank you, moving forward with at least one or two agents is usually key to your success. Stay rooted in place and you'll just be swarmed and brought down. So how to manage that process? Well, the basics are still true. Hunting for a path that has cover is essential. And while full cover is a relative rarity in this game, that makes it all the more precious when it's available. So go for it. A word of warning though, I've found cover to be more fragile on a number of maps, so even if you do move behind it, it's not uncommon to end up exposed to flanking shots if it gets destroyed. As always, you'll need to assess the enemies you're facing and where they are on the map. One big change from previous entries in the series is that you'll see absolutely all of the aliens and don't have to worry about triggering a new pod by accident. So you are free to move wherever you want, and while there will be plenty of hostiles waiting to make you pay for it, at least they won't take you by surprise. Partly because of that, the longer I've played, the more I found myself prioritizing flanking the enemy over taking the safest possible position for myself. It's often essential to keep whittling down their numbers and or pushing towards an objective. And there are enough ways to mitigate, heal, or even absorb incoming damage that it's often more important to push forward with what we need to accomplish over the illusion of trying to stay safe. The small maps and destructible cover will inevitably lead to getting flanked if we stay put. So why not dictate the action and choose the timing of when and where that will happen whenever possible? Okay, now let me just stop for a second and make clear that I'm not suggesting running around the map like a lunatic. I strongly recommend seeking out cover from as many angles as it's possible to get. I also recommend only exposing a flanking angle to preferably one and no more than two enemies if it can possibly be helped. And ideally you'll combine that exposure with a stun, a shield, or some other ability that will eliminate incoming damage or seriously limit it without having to rely on them just missing a lot. Finally, I should also add that the ability to take calculated risks increases as agents level up and gain new abilities, more health, and better armor. Agents are more fragile in the early game and there is less margin for error, so please keep that in mind. We're almost done talking about combat, but there are a couple of other things to go over. First, with all the juggling of priorities that this game requires, being efficient in how we use actions is a critical skill. With each agent getting just two actions per turn, how can we get the most out of them? How badly does your medic need to move? Can she heal and then shoot to finish off an enemy who's about to attack? Better still, can she use her melee stun attack to both finish him off and move to a better position in the process? If there's nothing an agent really needs to do before firing, check their ammo. If they're down even one round, then reload before firing. It could make the difference later in the encounter between running out when you can't afford to reload or not. Another thing to keep in mind is that using items is always a free action. You can use a grenade to destroy an enemy's cover or heal yourself with a medikit and still take a full turn afterwards. Little efficiencies like this can add up over the course of a mission, and if things are tight, they could make a difference between winning or failing. Speaking of subdue, this is an easy ability to overlook, but when an enemy is down to their last couple of health, it's a great way to get a guaranteed hit, save ammunition, and get a capture rather than a kill. It's well worth remembering this as an option. 
And finally, let's briefly touch on enemy reinforcements. I mentioned earlier that you'll see all of the enemies on the map, and that's true, but some missions do feature enemy reinforcements. There's typically one to three entrances marked with a skull icon, and it's possible to overwatch those locations. But just be aware that they may or may not use any one of those entrances in any given round. Also, keep in mind that while the reinforcements may seem endless, it is possible to outlast them if you stay and fight for long enough. That said, you're often better off just going to the extraction point if there is one, or doing whatever it takes to simply end the mission, rather than engage in round after round of pointless fighting. As promised, there are a couple of tips that didn't make it into part one of my combat guide where I focused on breach mode, so let's talk about those now. First, when selecting an entry point, you'll see that it's possible to adjust the turn order of your squad by clicking on the arrows next to each entry point, and that offers extra flexibility in planning the breach. Also, if there is a breach ability that you want to use and you missed it for whatever reason when the agent was first added to the breach point, you can click on the character portrait and select it that way. And this process can be a little finicky. The smoke bomb can apparently only be used by the second person in a breach point, and the first person through a particular entrance generally can't use any ability or item at all. All right, if you've stayed with me this long and found the video helpful and or interesting, then please give it a like to help convince YouTube's computers that other people might want to watch it too. It really does help. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, you might want to do that as I will continue to cover XCOM for quite some time. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. I hope we see you next time.